Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. My name is Alex. With me to my left is Julia. What up? And with me in another city, in another country, in another time, is Noel. Vaguely in a southwestern direction, soon to be vaguely in a southeastern direction. Indeed, indeed. For the Adrocks are moving. The Adrocks will be becoming the Adrocks West Coast. <laughs> I wanted to say something cool, and then I... I, 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 I panicked. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not familiar with my West Side represent slang. <laughs> you will be. I will be. You will be by the end of the year. Yeah. You'll be on the coast that Carpenter lives on. There you go. Getting close to those roots. We're away from Stephen King, and now we're going <laughs> towards Carpenter. Yeah. I think it, he would think it was for the best. I think so, too. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see if that changes your opinion of Christine at all. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Indeed. So yes, we are here to cover a bit of an unusual film in, in the John Carpenter canon. Not quite as unusual as what we're going to be covering in the next one, but Black Moon Rising, which is a film that gets a lot of TV play from what I've seen. So there's a lot of people who know about it. I don't think many people know that it has a Carpenter connection. Hmm. Is this a film that either of you have seen? No, never even heard of it until we started doing this. No. I had heard of it for, I want to say, somewhere in the last decade, and I've seen it in the TV listings, and I know I've seen like five minutes of Tommy Lee Jones in a car, <laughs> but I've never watched the movie. I think I've heard the name before, but I've always associated it. I always thought it was like a werewolf movie or something. Yeah, it, it does sound like it should be for a werewolf. <laughs> and then like I know there was Bad Moon Rising was actually a werewolf project that Wes Craven was trying to get off the ground in the 90s before he then went off and made Cursed. Mm. So that is also a title that's been floating around and yeah, it does create a little mix up in the head. Absolutely. So yes, sorry to disappoint our listeners, not a John Carpenter werewolf movie. <laughs> Though that would be amazing. So Black Moon Rising was released on January 10th, 1986. I can't find any details about its budget, but it only pulled in $6.5 million during its theatrical run. Hmm. But as I said, it's been on TV a lot, even though I've never watched it. I think that's why I was confused, because I thought it was a TV movie, because I've never heard of this being a theatrical release. And then when we watched the film, there being uh, bare breasts and copious amounts of swearing, I was confused. I'm like, would that get on TV? It felt like a TV movie, yeah. Like an early HBO movie or something. <laughs> yeah, like a Showtime thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> which I think is actually where it gets a lot of run. I mean, I see it on the Encore stations a lot, which I know are affiliated with Showtime. So it's probably part of some library that's been circulated around. And it has been readily available on DVD for a while. Hmm. There is obviously enough interest that they've kept it out there. So hopefully it's made its money back. <laughs> the film was produced and distributed by New World Pictures, the company founded by Roger Corman. Do you remember how I said Escape from New York was the only film on which Corman and Carpenter crossed paths? Apparently this one as well. Nope. That is still the only film where they crossed paths. In 1983, Corman sold New World. Oh. And he went off and founded New Horizons. In 1984, New World released a project that they had acquired from Avco Embassy, a film called The Philadelphia Experiment, mm. which, again, I will be covering in the next episode. As a reminder, Carpenter had done some development work on Philadelphia Experiment and was attached to direct it right after The Fog as part of a two-picture deal with Avco Embassy, but ultimately left that project and made Escape from New York instead. Carpenter was still billed as an executive producer on the project, and the other producers of Philadelphia Experiment were hoping to work with Carpenter again, so he handed them Black Moon Rising, another one of those infamous scripts that he wrote in the late 70s. Six degrees. As I said, every film that we are going to hit that only credits John Carpenter as a writer from here on out is going to be a script that he wrote back in the late 70s. Mm. Even we got Silent Predators in 1999 or 2000, which is still a script that he wrote in the 70s. Wow. And again, Carpenter is still also an executive producer on Black Moon Rising. I don't know what level of involvement he actually had, but we'll talk about it because there are some shared crew, some interesting ideas here and there. The other two producers were Douglas Curtis and Joel B. Michaels, and Philadelphia Experiment of Black Moon Rising are their only collaborations to date. 
Curtis got to start producing and directing his own 70s indie horror film called The Hazing, and would only direct again in 1990 with Sleeping Car, also a horror film, though he is also the second unit director of Black Moon Rising. His other work as a producer includes, and this is a very odd title, Nice Girls Don't Explode, <laughs> Philadelphia Experiment 2, The 18th Angel, Next Friday, Friday After Next, Save the Last Dance, National Lampoon Presents Replicate, <laughs> All About the Benjamins, Freddy vs. Jason, Cellular, Shoot 'em Up, Sorority Row, and Shark Knight 3D. That is an interesting collection of titles. I was going to say, that is a very strange <laughs> Netflix recommends. <laughs> Joel B. Michaels got his start in 1971 as a co-writer and producer of the biker exploitation flick The Peace Killers. Great title. As a producer, he quickly became a frequent partner of famed blockbuster producer Mario Kassar, and his credits include The Silent Partner, The Changeling, The Amateur, Losing It, Universal Soldier, Stargate, Last of the Dogmen, Cutthroat Island, Basic Instinct 2, Terminator 3, Terminator Salvation, and Terminator The Sarah Connor Chronicles. Every one of those films I've seen, I am ashamed that I have watched. <laughs> Including losing it? <laughs> Especially losing it. Two very interesting producers, and I'm kind of surprised that this and Philadelphia Experiment are the only two films that they actually cross paths on. Very strange. As I said, the original draft of the screenplay was written by Carpenter in the 70s. The bulk of the shooting script was a heavy, heavy rewrite by William Gray. I will get into how heavy a rewrite later. Gray was a frequent collaborator of exploitation director Paul Lynch, no relation to David Lynch, for whom he wrote Blood and Guts, Prom Night, Humongous, and Cross Country, and I have also read his script for Prom Night, which is actually a very good read. And his other film credits include Philadelphia Experiment, The Changeling, An Eye for an Eye, The Abduction of Carrie Swenson, Killer Deal, and Killer Wave, as well as episodes of The Hitchhiker, In the Heat of the Night, Robocop, FX, Largo Winch, and Beastmaster. <laughs> Somewhere in there, there was some additional writing done by Desmond Nakano, who also wrote Body Rock, Last Exit to Brooklyn, and American Me, as well as directing White Man's Burden and American Pastime. Early posters in the back of the DVD also credit Steve Desjarnet, who wrote and directed Miracle Mile, directed a bunch of TV, and also wrote Strange Brew, Future Sport, and episodes of X-Files, Aeon Flux, and Poltergeist the Legacy. <laughs> Despite being California born and Illinois raised, director Harley Cokeless got his start doing documentaries in England, then moved into making films, also often writing and producing his own work, with credits like The Battle of Billy's Pond, The Glitter Ball, That Summer, Battle Truck, Malone, Dream Demon, Pilgrim, and Angel for May, and Paris Connections, as well as episodes of Hercules, Xena, and the 90s Robin Hood. All of that sounds amazing. I forgot there was a 90s Robin Hood. Was that mainly in Canada? I would assume so. <laughs> okay. Interestingly, he was also the second unit director of a little film you may have heard of called Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. Hmm. Rings a bell. <laughs> <laughs> I find it deeply fascinating that the two John Carpenter-related projects that involve Tommy Lee Jones, Eyes of Laura Mars was directed by the director of Empire Strikes Back, and Black Moon Rising was directed by the second unit director of Empire Strikes Back. What does it mean? Why is Tommy Lee Jones the hidden corner of this triangle? <laughs> <laughs> So I just have three more names here to mention. The composer Lalo Schifrin is a famed composer and conductor with a wealth of credits going back to the 50s, which are too numerous to list here, though I will just mention The Exorcist, Enter the Dragon, and the Dirty Harry films. He's like in his 80s and he's still a working conductor, even conducting scores that he doesn't compose for movies and TV. But what he's probably best known for is the theme song to Mission Impossible. Oh, okay. And then just two John Carpenter-related credits. The editor, Todd Ramsey, was also the editor on Escape from New York and The Thing. And the sound team of David Udall, John Post, and Steve Rice also worked on Escape from New York, Halloween 2, The Thing, Christine, and The Philadelphia Experiment. So even beyond this being a Carpenter script, it does feel like there is some carryover, some further ties in there. And him being an executive producer on this, it feels like it's still kind of part of that team. Mm -hmm. This is the story of three groups. The first are the trio of Engineer Wyndham, Mechanic Thaden, and Driver Billy, who have just successfully tested the prototype of their high-powered, light-performance supercar, the Black Moon, and are heading to L.A. with dreams of selling it to one of the major auto companies. The second is Quint, a thief looking to retire who's in the middle of a tricky job where he's stolen financial records from a dirty company for the feds, with Ringer, a bitter old partner of his, now working for the company and on his tail. 
The third is Nina, a professional car thief plucked from the streets for the massive corporatized car stealing operation of Ryland, the CEO of Ryland Industries, who burns through high model cars and sells them to European interests. Wyndham and his crew cross paths with Quint at a desert gas station where he hides the tape with the financial records in the body of the Black Moon. He follows them into the city where they're hashing out a deal only for the Black Moon to be stolen by Nina. She loves the rocket-powered ride and wants to keep it for herself, but she's at odds with Ryland over a deal that's gone bad, so he decides to keep it for himself. Quint teams up with the others, who are quickly down a member when Thaden is killed during an attempt to recover the car on their own, and Quint guides them through a complicated plan to infiltrate the high-tech and highly secured pair of Ryland Industry Towers. He also crosses paths with Nina, fully letting her know what he's up to as they begin a romance. Ryland catches on, though, locking Nina away as Quint, Wyndham, and Billy execute their massive operation. They free Nina along the way, and Ryland is run down as they launch the Black Moon out of a window, jumping from one tower to another. There, Quint has a final smackdown with Ringer, gets paid off by the feds, returns the car to Wyndham and Billy, and walks off to a new life with Nina. So, Alex, do you recommend Black Moon Rising? Sadly, no, and it goes against a lot of my core values being future cars and <laughs> skullduggery and Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones' definite high point, as is Linda Hamilton's wig selection. <laughs> uh, Especially and, that first wig, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, and it does boast a fight scene, a spiritual companion to the fight scene from They Live, but uh, mm. I found the movie just took too long. It just took too long to get where it's going. There was a lot of plot holes that I couldn't overlook. It just was a little dry, a little dry for me. I think I would have liked this a lot more if I had seen it in the past. I'm going to have to go with a thumbs down on this one. Copyright Ebert. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, do you recommend the movie? I think this movie would have been great if I was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't they all? Elvis would just be sad and boring if you were drunk. I know. But yeah. I think if this was drunk, I would have thought it was hilarious. <laughs> but unfortunately, I was sober and therefore it was just sad. I know. Like, if I'd seen this in a group, it would have been a lot better, especially at the scene that Fast and the Furious 7 completely rips off yeah. and we'll discuss later. <laughs> but yeah, it was boring and lame and didn't make any sense. <laughs> I think that's on the back of the box. It, yeah, it's like two stars, boring, lame, doesn't make any sense. And then underneath that's like, what else are you going to do? Just rent it, dummy. <laughs> I I do not recommend the film, too. I did enjoy the movie. I did find it kind of fun and actually kind of slickly put together at times, and the cast is great. But it's not very good. It is kind of clunky and poorly structured and paced, and it's not a very smart movie. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> it's not. But, I mean, that said, it actually does still have a kind of carpenterish vibe to it that I found it interesting. Mm -hmm. Given how little of his actual script is on screen, I will just say, while the loose framework of the story is here, only about, I want to say, six or seven pages worth of Carpenter's writing is actually here on screen. So there's very little actual Carpenter here, and yet there's still a lot of moments that have a very Carpentery feel. It's not a film that people need to go out and see. It's not that interesting. It's not that entertaining. It's not particularly clever. But it's also not that bad. And it's something that if you catch it on TV on a lazy Sunday, it's a great watch. It can be fun. But yeah, it's just not that great. You're just not going to remember it a few days later. <laughs> yeah. You're going to remember Linda Hamilton's wigs. Yes, especially the first wig. That wig was wearing a wig. <laughs> that was a double wig. I read two scripts for this film, one of them twice, and I watched the film twice. One of those viewings I just finished, I want to say an hour ago. And yeah, there's parts that I'm already forgetting about this. Mm -hmm. I keep forgetting about the guy who's always at chasing after Tommy Lee Jones from his past. Yeah, you forget him and you're just like, who is this guy? When he reappears every time. He's forgettable. He's completely unthreatening. He looks like he should be, I don't know, British? I feel like if he had a British accent, his look would be more believable. Yeah. Also, I didn't understand what he wanted ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Revenge. Yeah, no, he was a character that was completely added. Uh, that's Lee Ving, who's actually a heavy metal singer, more than he is an actor. Maybe that explains the eyebrows. He does look like a Sunset Strip rocker. I could see that. He's got the rocker face, but he just does not have the build. He's just a completely forgettable, <laughs> unthreatening guy. <laughs> his big band was an L.A. punk rock band called Fear. Oh my god, I actually know them, yeah. And they're still active, yeah. Yeah, they are. They are indeed. Can you sing a song? No, I can't remember any of them. I know them by reputation. Oh. 
let's talk about the Black Moon, the car. It's silly looking. It doesn't look as cool as Knight Rider, the car that ripped it off. <laughs> Knight Rider is the bomb. Well, actually, the whole thing with Knight Rider is that this script was written before Knight Rider premiered. This film was made after Knight Rider premiered, so I think it's like a both sides were borrowing from each other. Okay. I actually did start watching the Knight Rider pilot today, just to compare. There's like no similarities in terms of story. It's just cool looking guy in a black leather jacket with a black and red supercar. That's the only similarities. I was told that this was going to be John Carpenter writing Knight Rider. That's what I and thought And what it was. I got... That was similar was the fact that there was a black car in it, and at one point, someone puts an audio tape inside it, but it never talks. It never does anything cool. <laughs> it doesn't have that light on the front. As the one who told you that, I apologize. I was wrong. I am glad you can admit it. <laughs> I didn't even make it through the entire pilot because it wasn't that good. <laughs> Night Rider? Oh, yeah. I loved it when yeah. I was a kid, but I have not watched that. I watched it when I was a kid, too. I thought yeah. it was great. I will say, David Hasselhoff is actually the best thing on the show. Oh, nice. I can freely admit I had a crush on that car. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That explains it. If you guys want to take from that what you want, you can. <laughs> it's the Mr. Feeny mobile. But, oh, yeah. He does do the voice. Yeah. yeah I was into him. <laughs> you into the cars? That I wanted to ride him. Gas? <laughs> all night long. Like just blasting Brian Adams. <laughs> so grabbing the wheel and steering us back to Black Moon Rising. Unnecessary. <laughs> way more interesting. <laughs> The Black Moon, it looks like a door wedge. It does look like a door wedge. It's very impractical. It's very small. It looks remote controlled. Yeah. It's too wide. The red frame around it just looks silly. The foil on the tail just doesn't look good. It looks like a little TV remote driving around. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bad time to take us up. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it plays such a little part in the story. Yeah, it's really not that big a deal. The cassette is more important to the story than the car. There's no point in the car even existing. No, <laughs> He could have just hid that in Linda Hamilton's purse. The car is just a MacGuffin. It's entirely just a MacGuffin. And, and yeah. to be fair, this goes back to the Carpenter script, where in the first 20 pages, the car is stolen, and they don't get it back until the last 20 pages. And for the majority of the film, it's just sitting there in a warehouse. And it's like, use the damn car. Because they started to use the car, and they realized how lame it was, and they're like, we better write in some really boring sex scenes, because we need to cover up for the fact how, how lame this car looks. Even at the end, when I'm like, the car is going to do something, I'm like, what is it going to do? And then Linda Hamilton just starts shooting people. And I'm like, that is yeah. not interesting. That's the other thing is that for a supercar, it's just a car. Yeah. It's just a car that has some jet thrusters on it. It has some flames on the back. And I'm like, we already saw that yeah. in like the Batmobile in the 60s. We're over I just, it. I don't even understand the practical aspect of the car. Like, it goes fast. It goes really fast. And in they, a like, desert? Break the sound barrier or something. Who knows? Out in the desert. But they're going to take it to sell it to who for what? Nina grabbed it because she personally wanted it. And Ryland is holding it because he's using it as leverage against Nina. So it's not that they were really going to sell it. No, I mean the guys who actually invented it. Were they German, oh, I think? Yeah. And well, then brought it to Los Angeles to sell it to people. For what? In the Carpenter script, it was the racing circuit. It was a car designed for the racing circuit. That would make sense. And they were heading out to LA where there is a Formula 500 race. And we're going to try to sell it into the racing circuit and also win lots of prizes and stuff. Based is, on this script, it seems to be intended for military purposes because they keep mentioning the Kevlar that it's built on. But what are they yeah. going to do? Get away as long as it's like a wide expanse of land? Honestly, the only reason they put that line in there is because you have the scenes of everyone shooting at the car and they didn't want to puncture the car. Because in the script, the car does get shot up quite a bit, but they only had one car for the shooting of the movie. This is the only one and only car they had for the entirety of the movie. They didn't have any backup cars. Yeah, because so like, the people that built it were too ashamed to go back to the shop and build another one. They're like, what have we done? <laughs> we quit moving. Yeah, and so it's like, we cannot put a single bullet hole in this car, so let's drop the line of Kevlar so that it's bulletproof. All right. Yeah, it's totally ADR. You can tell. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's written it's in. Kevlar. It's 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 no bullet nerd can hurt it. <laughs> yeah, it's a silly thing for the entire film to be built around you could have changed it to like a custom rebuilt 1950s cadillac that they're taking out to a car show mm -hmm. and he hid the tape in it and they steal it because they want a fancy cadillac that wouldn't change the story one bit except for the whole end bit where you drive from one bill into another that's true yeah i mean i get where they're coming from it was the 80s we liked future cars yeah. and cool robots and like specialized weapons and stuff like that so i understand that it's just such a stretch in this case well i just think it's a white guy in a suit who's just like ride a car in it put a car in it gotta keep the car in no don't cut the car people like cars that's gonna make money 
And the other thing was, in the original script, the thing that he hit on the car was a little magnetized lockbox, you know, like what people put spare keys in, that he would just kind of like clunk up underneath the body of the car. Instead, he puts the tape in the parachute holder, and we are established as the car having a parachute because of the high rates of speeds it goes at, yet that parachute never plays a role in the entirety of the movie. No, it doesn't. That should have actually been a plot twist where it's like he has a momentary decision where firing the parachute will save their life, but it will also probably destroy the tape that he has hidden in the parachute. What choice does he make? That already is too complicated a decision and highbrow of thought to put in this script to begin with. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's just weird that they threw out so much of Carpenter's script without really changing anything or adding anything or bringing any new ideas to the table. It's weird. It is very strange. It's almost like a bunch of people making some really bad decisions. <laughs> I'll get into more of it later, but let me just really quickly. The guy who's chasing after him was not in the Carpenter script. The feds are not in the Carpenter script. What he's stolen was not in the Carpenter script. The whole romance between him and Linda Hamilton was not in the Carpenter script. They were kind of opposing thieves and they did have this little bantery relationship, but they only really appear in two scenes together in the Carpenter script. There's no love scenes. There's no talking about Rio. The whole backstory that she has with Ryland was not in the Carpenter script. There's just a lot of stuff that they've added here without really adding anything with a point to it. And once again, we are mourning a better film that never was. <laughs> and yet, the Carpenter script was not really a better script. No. It was a more interesting script because it had all these background details that were just kind of buried. The character of Quint was like Snake Plissken or Napoleon Wilson, where you don't know where he came from. You don't know his backstory. You know he's running from someone, and he has this golden key in a lockbox that you don't know what it's going to open. He just wants it back. Hmm. And he's actually a hitman in the in the original, not a thief. Okay. But, I mean, it's like all this stuff that it, they, they wanted to explain the backstory. They wanted to explain what he has. They wanted to explain everything. This sounds like a bunch of stupid men in a room insisting that <laughs> things get written and put into scripts and they don't have to be. It's like, you forgot to tell us what this is all about. Yeah, but I, that's my the wife point. was confused when she read the first draft. She didn't get it. I think you need to rewrite it and put some more in here. Love scenes. I yeah. give you $2 million. <laughs> Make the car look lamer. <laughs> I guess I've already gotten into it. But yeah, those are the major changes of the script. The script is much more focused on breaking into the building. And in fact, that's actually one of the big problems of the script is so much of the, I want to say the entire second half of the script, because they break in much earlier, is them breaking into the building. And then it's just like one ridiculously booby-trapped room after another. <laughs> but they had such great blueprints to go on. That those blueprints were amazing. They looked like my drawing of the Batcave from when I was like 12. <laughs> <laughs> I like that he had to, like, get the beating of his life to get those blueprints. <laughs> After his friend is murdered, and it's basically just like, door here, go yeah. up tunnel. <laughs> it's like, look, we got these fantastic blueprints. Uh, here's the building. Uh, there's a door. <laughs> and it uh, looks like there's just this one tunnel that goes here, and we're good. And there's one-eyed Willie's treasure. Yes. <laughs> In the script, the big thing was that it was this entire underground sewer complex. That would be amazing. That is hidden underneath the building. And then actually the big climax of the building, instead of happening on the top floor, is throughout the entire him breaking through, he's planting like plastic explosives all over. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is like a big scene in the script. They're trapped in the basement and they have no way out. So they go up to an elevator, blow the elevator out of the shaft take a grappling hook, stick the grappling hook under the front of the car and turn on the elevator so the elevator cable and grappling hook literally just pull the Black Moon up into the elevator shaft. And while that's rising up the elevator shaft, Quint just grabs onto the back fender and just rides the back of the car all the way up to the top floor where when it hits the top floor, the gears swing the car out and then drop it right down on the penthouse floor on the top roof. And it's like just this ridiculous sequence. And then they drive out the window across to the building on the other side. And while Wyndham and Billy are just sitting there in the car, because they're the ones who are driving with him, not Nina. While they're just sitting there like, holy shit, we just jumped across buildings. Quint just checks his watch, presses a button, and the entire inside of the building collapses into that underground complex, completely obliterating everyone in it. And the building is just standing there and nobody will know. That sounds amazing. That also sounds like it requires a budget 
And yes. what we got was a half-finished soundstage that we were led to believe was an underground car-stealing operation. Yeah. But that does sound like a much better film. It was just this ridiculous thing of he just rides a car up an elevator shaft and they're just sitting there in this vertical car that's being pulled up an elevator shaft going, what the fuck just happened? Who is this guy? <laughs> but that already sounds a billion times more interesting than watching Linda Hamilton and Tommy Lee Jones have the worst sex I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yeah, I will get to them in a second, but yeah. <laughs> I was uncomfortable for them in the past. <sighs> yeah. That was rough. <laughs> Poor Linda Hamilton. That's another reason it's good that you sat out Halloween 3. Halloween 3 was even worse. It was Billy is the driver. He is an expert driver, so he is the one who's driving the car throughout the third act. Nina actually has this entire separate subplot where she's not in the building at all during the subplot. She is actually out doing an operation to steal a bunch of cars. At the beginning of the movie, you have this whole sequence where a celebrity has died and a whole bunch of the richest and wealthiest have shown up for this celebrity funeral. And while they're all mourning, they don't realize that Nina and 20 guys are all stealing their cars from the parking lot. And then the big thing at the end was going to be this big operation where while all this stuff is going down the building, Nina and her team of 20 guys are out at a Hollywood gala premiere where a film is being premiered and, you know, it's that whole red carpet line of celebrity after celebrity coming out of their limos and Rolls Royces, which are all being brought to a parking complex. So while all of the celebrities are in the theater watching the movie and Carpenter even has like a little parody of like a drama scene where it's like, and that was the night he told me he was a rabbi. <laughs> And while that's all going on, Nina and her gang are stealing all of the limos and Rolls Royces. And as they're coming back to the building, all of the shit's gone down so they can't get into the building. So there's this whole row of limos just sitting out there that's starting to get attention. So Nina calls an abort. All of their guys just get out of their cars and walk away. The big final scene is Nina goes back to her car, her own car, and starts to drive away when she rounds a corner. And there's Quint thumbing for a ride. <laughs> Because the only other scene that they shared in the script, there's that scene where he meets her in the nightclub. They have this little terse, cryptic conversation in the car of like, my friends had a car stolen. That sucks. I hope you get it back. That's the only scene that all of the dialogue is intact from the Carpenter script. They just have that scene. She drops him off and says, you're an interesting guy. If you ever need another ride sometime, let me know. And at the end of the movie, he's like, you still up for that ride? And they just drive off together. It sounds much better, again, <laughs> to me. Yeah, because the film, it just gets into, yeah, we need to have a romance. We need to make that the centerpiece of the story. It is particularly inexplicable, this romance, because it cuts right to it. And we're just like, what? They're having sex? What, what, what happened? Yeah, because they have that small conversation in the car, and then it's just like, shirts off and kissing. Yep. That was just so weird, reading the original script, and then reading the shooting draft, and then watching the film was like, they have that conversation, they part ways. In the shooting script, they have that conversation, cut to them in bed together, cut to them waking up, cut to her serving him tea, you know, having this whole conversation that doesn't add a damn thing. No, it really does not. It's very confusing. Though I do love the shot of shirtless Tommy Lee Jones on the motorcycle. Yes, he was straddling that thing. What do you guys think, though, about just kind of setting all that aside, just Tommy Lee Jones and Linda Hamilton? Tommy Lee Jones, I thought was great. I thought he was doing a good job. He delivered all his sassy banter really well. I liked him in the robbery scene in the beginning where we're introduced to him. I liked uh, his line delivery. There was one particular line I liked where someone was like, I have my moments. And he's like, you must have yours in private. <laughs> Linda Hamilton, uh, she was not very good in this. I did laugh, though, when she was playing her teenage self. That was yes. uh, hilarious. <laughs> The point of Linda Hamilton. Uh, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. I don't get it. <laughs> it's all Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Every other role I've seen her in, I've not enjoyed her performance. She is not a good actress. I, I'm just going to let... No, I want that to just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think she's great. I actually think she's horrible in Terminator 2. Really? I thought she's all right. I think it's impressive the physique that she built for it. But I don't think she's very good in it. What is the draw? What is making people go back to the Linda Hamilton well? Well, they didn't go back to the Linda Hamilton well after Terminator 2 Judgment Day. But I mean, she's in a significant amount of films. Not really, no. She was in a King Kong film. <laughs> Some people don't get one, and they're way better actors than Linda Hamilton. Don't bring up my acting career. <laughs> I don't have a problem with her as an actor for the most part. I don't find her particularly compelling, but nor do I find her all that bad. I just don't think she had anything to work with here. 
because they overly expanded the role to the point where it just had no relevance. In the original script, she doesn't even have a name. She's just Agent One. She's the leader of the car thieves. Oddly enough, everybody in the script had completely different names. I don't know why they had to go and change everybody. <laughs> but yeah, no, she was this unnamed figure who still played this big role, but it just, I don't get it. I don't understand why they felt they had to go where they went with it, because mm -hmm. it's not interesting. I think they wanted to have a romance in it, and they wanted to have sex scenes, and they need to justify them. So they created scenes where they had to have some sort of conversation in order to lead to the sex scene, mm -hmm. and none of it works, but because some dick decided he wanted to have romance involved in it, they had to include it in order to make some sort of coherent sense. I think you're right. It does seem like a bunch of notes, and it's like checking off the notes like here's the sex scene that you wanted sir yeah i was surprised because this was two years after terminator and like of all the films for her to go topless in she's going to agree to do it in this one well she was topless in terminator as well it's well, actually it the exact silhouetted. same sex scene it was scene. silhouetted i'm not sure about that it's just an odd film that when you've had that successful of a film and you suddenly have a lot of pull in terms of your choice of roles yeah Plus, yeah, it was an incredibly awkward sex scene. And then you have that whole scene at the end where it's like he's too painful to have sex. I kind of like that part. That was at least something as opposed to the other one, which was nothing. My main problem with it was in the way this film was originally written and shot, she was raped. Oh, my God. You know that part where she was locked up in the room and she was like, I dare you to go for it or whatnot? You can see the edits where they edited around that. Wow. Well, they made a good choice taking it out. You have that really creepy assistant guy for Ryland who's mm -hmm. like dragging her away. Ryland, Is that why she shoots him in the face? Yes. Because if that's the case, then yeah, go ahead. As he was dragging her out of the office, Ryland's original line was, she was a whore when I found her, treat her like one. Ew. But they've now then 80 yard over a new line. And then when he throws her in the closet, you know, you just have that shot of her looking up and saying, just try it. That was then followed by a shot where he starts taking off his jacket saying, I've wanted to do this for a long time. Well, I, uh, I'm pleased that they decided to remove all of that. Yeah. And yet they still have like the bit where, you know, after Tommy Lee Jones frees her, she kind of breaks down a little bit. You have like the whole payoff with her killing the guy. It's weird that they still have elements of it in there. They should have cut out her killing him because she's facing Flat the out, bad yeah. guy, turns to his assistant, shoots him in the head. Square in the head. And yeah. then they take off. In the reality of this movie now, because we have to work with what we've been given, she is now a cold-blooded killer. Yeah, she just straight up murdered a guy. <laughs> yeah, whereas before I'd be like, okay, I get that. Yeah, yeah that makes cool. more sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, to be fair, I, I wouldn't call it murder because it was, how did she draw that gun while everyone had guns pointed at her already? They should have all taken her down. Doesn't matter. She still shot him in the head. That's where the creepy guy needed to be built up as more of a character, as more of a rival to her. Build an actual rivalry that you have that as the payoff of, you know? There needed to be something more there that wasn't there. Yeah, because they cut it out. <laughs> but the direction that was there, I'm kind of glad they cut it out because the story did not need to go there, period. Then, when you do cut out that motivation, yeah. you have one of our main characters who are we're supposed to care for and be on their side murder someone in cold blood before taking off in a car. <laughs> yeah, and he is a killer, but she doesn't really know that. She didn't see that guy garrot that other guy or whatever you pronounce that. I think that's where they wrote themselves in a corner. Because you have this guy who is a prominent presence in the film, but you then would remove any payoff of what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And that's where I wish that they had figured this out on set so that they could have done something different there. Yeah. And that guy, by the way, is Nick Cassavetes, the son of actor and filmmaker John Cassavetes. Wow. Who has since gone on to become like a director in his own right. Okay, that's good, because I was going to say the apple has fallen very far from the dream. He still acts a lot. He was actually in Face Off, too. Oh. As, I want to say, like the brother of the Gina Gershon character. I'm always going to have a soft spot for Face Off. <laughs> yeah, so he directed uh, She's So Lovely, John Q, The Notebook, Alpha Dog, My Sister's Keeper, Yellow, and The Other Woman. So, I mean, he still has a career. All right. What's weird about having read Carpenter's original script is, you know what project it most reminded me of? What's that? Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, because of the crazy corporation with all these weird... Like, what point does it serve for a corporation to run a car thieving ring? It doesn't. Their motivations make no sense. And the fact that yeah. they drive them, like, a few blocks away to be sold is insane. Well, I mean, the thing is, he is actually shipping them overseas. They did not clarify it on screen. But okay. that's why he's talking to the one guy from Europe who then gets garroted in the elevator. So it's like Gone in 60 Seconds, where they're gathering them all up, sending them to the docks, and then shipping them away. 
But why are you selling them to Europe if you're in L.A.? Why aren't you selling them to Asia? And why are you storing them in like a showcase semicircle? <laughs> Yeah, the whole display room. Because originally that top floor was supposed to be his penthouse apartment. Right. So it was supposed to be a big thing of their squealing a car around and destroying his penthouse apartment. Okay. But like Halloween 3, you were saying, he does seem like he could have been revealed as a robot at any point in time. Well, I mean, what I mean is, as I said, a large part of the script is them breaking into the building and having to go into room after room after room of crazily elaborate booby traps. Even surrounding the building, the traffic lights have laser beams in them and shit like that. It's just weird. And it also reminds me a bit of, like, and we'll get to Big Trouble in Little China, like that whole end piece where they're just running around this massive complex full of monsters and booby traps and soldiers, and they don't know where they're going, what to do, what's going to be in the next room. It has that very much same feel to it. Mm -hmm. But Quint is basically MacGyver, so he basically figures a way out of everything with, like, some gadget or thing that he improvises. From the Carpenter script, you do get the laser beams that are taking out the security cameras and stuff like that. Mm hmm I honestly think most of that was just thrown out because this is such a low-budget movie that they were just kind of stuck with what locations they could get. Yeah, that makes sense. So they had to kind of throw things out. I don't know. It's just, why was Keenan Wynn in this? I don't know. He served no purpose other than to hold one of the keys they needed to complete the quest, basically, which was the blueprints. In the Carpenter script, that character is there, but he's called Iron John because he's literally in a full iron lung. And is just talking to them by radio. Budgetary restraints. Everything looks like it was nearby the set. Yeah. Here's a spot we could find. Yeah. We'll make use of it. This is like a half-completed building. They'll let us shoot overnight. We have to clear out by morning, and we can't leave any of our donuts behind. <laughs> well, they blew the door, and they can get out. Well, what do we use to stop them? Well, here's a cheap piece of iron fence. <sighs> Absolutely. It looks quasi-LA futuristic. Sorry, we've lost you there. Oh, no, that's fine. You don't know how right you are. Uh, I've been in charge of the cleanup. And if you don't clean it up properly, they won't let you come back. It's true. That was another big thing about the script was when you are introduced to this operation, when you finally go into the underground business, it's supposed to be this one single camera shot as cars are brought onto a conveyor belt. It's kind of like the opening of Christine as you see a single shot of them going along a conveyor belt where they'll take a car apart and move the parts to the cars behind it and gradually taking cars apart and rebuilding them, taking them apart, rebuilding them. While Nina's having this conversation with Ryland walking along the conveyor belt. And it's like, that would have been a beautiful shot. Hmm. They could not afford to even have a conveyor belt. So it's just a bunch of cars kind of scattered around in random fashion. Yeah. You never see any of them taken apart. You just see some people over them with welding torches. They couldn't afford to probably hurt the cars at all. Yeah, it's very cheap. It is very cheap. It does look very unfinished. And yet, I do think the film is well shot. I do think the cinematography is good. It actually has a very Carpenter slickness to it. It has an 80s sheen, like a yeah. Carpenter 80s sheen. Like, I noticed that in the beginning where I'm like, oh, this feels very Carpenter-ish because of the green computer text in the beginning. The green computer text and even just the shots of, you know, as silly of a design as it is, the shots of the black moon in the desert. Yeah. I think it's shot and cut very much like a Carpenter film. Yeah. That 80s kind of cool. It's a cinematographer who had never worked with Carpenter, but he was a Russian guy who came over to America, just did like four or five movies, and then went back to Russia. Mm. The only other American one that I know of is Prancer, that one with the girl and the reindeer. Oh, yeah, I remember that. From like way early 90s. I know I saw it way back then. I haven't seen it since. <laughs> no, I neither have I, but I think I did see it. Lame. You guys are lame. It's totes lame. <laughs> 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 I'll stick to Jingle all the way. Well, that would have been like 1992. I would have been 10. Uh -huh. <laughs> Super lame. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, as cheap as it is, as silly as the script is, it still does have a style and an atmosphere to it that I do mm. really like. And that does surprisingly still feel like Carpenter, despite the fact it's not by Carpenter and it's thrown out most of Carpenter. I liked Tommy Lee Jones getting beat up. That was really good. That was a great scene. Yeah. Very well done. It I just did, kept going. Yeah. I didn't like how he then, like, they did it good where he, like, drove back to her house and, like, couldn't see properly and stuff. So I appreciate that. But it turns out he really just needed that cool bath. And then all of his wounds were healed. And a shot of whiskey. Oh, well, that did it. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, Jules. That actually reminds me from the script. That love scene that they ended it on where he's too hurt happened there. Oh. Yeah. 
That would make sense. That would make sense, yeah. Yeah. Because it didn't make sense how he was fine to do, like, repelling. Well, no, that's actually why he was having such a hard time with it. It was supposed to be because he was hurt, but they didn't really sell that. Instead, yeah. they were like, no, the cord's coming loose. Yeah, they made it seem like it was technical. Because yeah. I was just like, how are his ab muscles doing this? I saw him get kicked in the balls twice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not lightly. <laughs> they threw him onto a car. Yeah, head oh, first. They, they just beat it. the crap out of him, yeah. yeah. And I think a large part of it still works just because Tommy Lee Jones is fun to watch. He sells the hell out of it. He's a solid actor. He's got the dry... He's cool as hell in this role. Yeah, absolutely. Even the opening scene, which has nothing to do with the story, was not part of the character thing, where it's just him and the guy holding up the store. That's a nice way to introduce the character. Yeah, you can totally see like his later roles, like Men in Black and the fugitive mm -hmm. roles and stuff like that, in that performance. Her car was stolen. I don't care! <laughs> But about the style, though, I think the one part where it comes together the best, and this is a scene that is straight from the Carpenter script, and I think it feels very much Carpenter, is that one where the one of the three guys gets killed, where one car comes by and runs him over, and then a garbage truck comes by and scoops him up, yeah. and then he's gone. That was cold as ice, but yeah, I could see that being very Carpenter. Yeah, they really bounced back from that quite well, didn't they? Yeah, they didn't really care that their no. friend was dead. But What's <laughs> weird, though, is that they made the character death. Yeah, to make it extra sad. Which doesn't come from any of the drafts. I'm just thinking that, did they just want to justify why he couldn't hear the car coming? He yes. should have been able to feel those vibrations after Absolutely. I call yeah. bullshit. Yeah. But he already sees the garbage truck coming from the other direction. So why don't you just have that's just masking the sound? Though I do actually like that they take advantage of that by then dropping all the sound from the soundtrack and having it happen silently. Yeah, great job, guys. It still doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no, well, the whole movie doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Future cars. And that's the thing I want to stress is that even the Carpenter script is still pretty nonsensical. I think it plays a lot more, but it was it was not like, you know, the problems that we had in Escape from New York. Where it's like there's a lot of cool stuff happening, but it's also not explaining stuff. And yet it's not explaining stuff to remain cryptic, but because it doesn't care. Mm -hmm. uh, you won't notice this if we just kind of like pretend this doesn't happen. Or it's trying to mask its flaws with a kind of fake air of crypticness, which I know was one of the big problems we had with the world building in Escape from New York. Mm -hmm. How it's like all this stuff is kind of interesting until you think about it and then it doesn't make any sense. No, it's true. The script had that problem too. Even Carpenter's draft. Mm. It's an odd film. I, know, I mean, it's again, it's a film I will watch again. A film I've watched twice here and I haven't gotten that bored with it. Yeah. Probably catch it when it's on TV again because it's still on TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, any final thoughts? I, I don't dislike the movie, but again, I'm not going to recommend it. Uh, it's what I call the Metro effect. I always call that for movies that are sort of like, they're not bad. They're not good. They're right at that 50% mark where I'm just, I'm never going to remember what happens. I forget it like as soon as I watch it. Go back into the pond, little fish. I will probably never see you again. <laughs> Julia, any final thoughts? This movie's lame and no one should watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it had like, ugh, I've already forgotten it. Like, I don't even care. <laughs> you didn't even watch it? No, I wasn't <laughs> even there. I've just been commenting on stuff that could have happened in that movie. Maybe. That good guesses. <laughs> Yay. I'm pretty good at what I do. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. You know what? I love bad movies. I love bad movies. I don't sit and watch bad movies and pick apart all the problems that are with them. Mm -hmm. It just pisses me off because this movie is fucking lazy. It is lazy and badly made and a bunch <laughs> of people got together and decided their decisions were the best and because they had more money or a bigger fucking dick, their fucking <laughs> ideas got into the script and what you have is a quilt, a hideous quilt of boring that no one should have to sit through. So yeah, no, I don't recommend it. <laughs> I, I, I don't share the vehemence, but you are not wrong. <laughs> it is. It's one of those ones where it's not so bad that it's entertainingly bad. No. It's just kind of mediocre and flat. I was bored. Yeah. yeah. I'm more harsh with films that I find boring than I am with something that doesn't have a particular point of view, but has like a verve to it. I mean, I'll be honest, a large part of my interest in the movie and my delight with watching it was just my fascination of how much they changed without making a difference. I think I would have found a lot more to like if I was doing that. But from yeah. what was presented to me, no thank you. But even that, it didn't make me like the film anymore. It just made me more intrigued by it. Yeah. As a film, I still find it entertaining enough to throw on a lazy afternoon. It doesn't bug me, but it also doesn't do a thing for me. Yeah. I'd rather watch Roll Bounce. <laughs> Aside from Tommy Lee Jones just being Tommy Lee Jones. Yes, which he can always do. Yeah. If you go in wanting to see a good Tommy Lee Jones performance, you'll get one, but there's better movies to get that into. Mm -hmm. Use your scene selection function. <laughs> 
But even then, I still like how it's shot. I like how it's cut together. There are still moments in there that I enjoy. But even, even yeah, the big final moment of let's fly across buildings. Yeah. Oh, I totally called that because I'm the smartest, right? You did call it and I didn't believe you. I'm like, nope, they don't have the budget. You're totally wrong. But she was totally right. You were also not wrong that they didn't have the budget. But <laughs> <laughs> no, Well, yeah. They did not execute that very well. They still went for it. And that's what counts. And then I love the big final line. Forget the Italians call Boeing. <laughs> that's true. I couldn't hear what they said at first. I'm like, uh. Like, really? Oh, you're sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I did like the villain guy because he's the bad guy in basketball. Um, yeah, Robert Vaughn. Yeah. So I just kept <laughs> all his like double entendres <laughs> with uh, Jenny McCarthy where he's like, uh, I think we should shampoo your carpet later. <laughs> <laughs> I just pictured him saying those things to Linda Hamilton. <laughs> Robert Vaughn, what's amazing is he's had a very long, very rich career. But yeah, people of our generation are really only going to know him from basketball. Basketball and I think Joe's apartment. So yeah, I think that brings our episode to a close. As I said, we wish the Adrox well in their move. Thank you. Across the great lands to the north. Mm. Thank you. Now I will be back with some special guests next month for Philadelphia Experiment. And then the two of you shall be back. And Kevin shall be back for Big Trouble in Little China. Bum, bum, bum. Good night, everybody. Thank you for listening to Masters of Carpentry. And... That's it. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to come up with some pithy reference to what happened in the movie. I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like you guys forgot a really boring, stupid movie. <laughs> and from Julia. <laughs> <laughs> I got comments. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. I got to face off from the video store back when you rented uh, videotapes. Mm -hmm. The last 20 minutes of it were unwatchable. Like it just went to snow. Oh. And so I went to return it and I talked to the guy behind the counter and I'm like, yeah, I rented this movie and like the last 20 minutes, it's like the tape's totally messed up. And he's like, I'm so sorry, ma'am. Uh, uh, I'll give you a refund for that. We'll make sure to take it off the shelf. And I'm like, yeah, obviously granted. But I like grabbed onto his hand. I'm like, you need to tell me how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, I didn't see that. And I'm like, you're useless. Yeah. What are you doing behind that counter? <laughs> <laughs> Lady, don't take my face. <laughs> oh, you missed the speedboat chase. This is before the internet. <laughs> I couldn't just Google it. <laughs> well, and to this day, I've not seen the end of Face Off. We'll watch Face Off. Watch <laughs> there is a speedboat chase. <laughs> yeah. If you miss the speedboat chase, you need to see the speedboat chase. I was just in it for Margaret Cho anyways. I keep forgetting she's Oh, yeah, it. that's right. <laughs> the whole reason I rented it. <laughs> What's that one that you really like? What I was, uh, my earbud fell out. The Nicolas Cage movie. Which one? That you really like. A lot of them. Oh, okay. I love Nicolas Cage. I know you do. <laughs> it's a shame Carpenter and Cage have never collaborated. That would be a wonderful collaboration. They could pull off, like, I think Carpenter could do one more of his, like, Big Trouble in Little China films just for fans. I think he could kickstart that and we'd do that. If we could get Cage to star in another music video from Carpenter's album. That's right. That's actually would also be amazing. I barely remember Joe's apartment. I just remember Joe switching t-shirts all the time. Joe's apartment was the first MTV movie. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Facts. Which I know I saw back in the day, but man, I have not seen that in a long time. I didn't like it because I um, didn't like the look of the cockroaches. Although yeah. I did like Jerry O'Connell because the sliders. How did it stand up next to Monkey Bone? Um, you know what? If you're going to bring up Brendan, <laughs> you better bring it. Because <laughs> I will not hear a bad word said about that man. Jerry O'Connell? I will take Kangaroo Jack over Joe's apartment. Interesting. I really genuinely enjoy Kangaroo Jack. Doesn't he fight a CGI kangaroo in that? I never saw Kangaroo Jack, but I know that the people who saw it were really upset because they were promised a talking kangaroo and they didn't get one. You know what? I'm really upset because I was promised a talking car in this movie and I didn't get one. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I am sorry, Julia. Black Moon Rising. I am sorry. I Black am sorry. Moon failing more like guys. Oh! oh. 
Black moon spreading. I don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was unexpected. <laughs> Yeah, that actually, now that I visualize Yeah, you can think that through. <laughs> that is a very different movie and rating system.